Well, I work here at uh, the Center for Landscape Research focuses on sustainable community design for people and housing is a key, if not the key component of that. And we try to think about ways where housing is considered not just as the provision of occupiable dwelling space, but also how it relates to other sustainability issues like transportation, uh, mixed land uses and the preservation of uh, natural amenities and natural systems in in the areas that are built up or rebuilt. Well, I would I would I would suggest that uh, there are two main challenges for housing in Vancouver, and I I don't think uh, any of this is new. Uh, the main challenge number one is affordable housing. We have people in their in their late twenties and early thirties who work for us here or simply can't afford to buy a home of any kind. Uh, so the same things that are part of Vancouver's success are also its failure, that there's a whole generation of people who can afford to live here. Uh, the uh, second aspect of that, which relates to the first, is that there's a huge uh, demographic shift about to occur, occurring now, which is insuff insufficiently acknowledged by citizens or policymakers, and that's the dramatic change in family type and size. The short story is that the baby boomers are done having their kids, and their kids are not having kids. Uh, so what that means is the people my age are empty nesters, uh, and uh, our kids are never nesters. So uh, what that has precipitated is a dramatic drop in the average family size, moving from like four and a half to around two or less, and dropping fast. So what you have is a city full of bungalows, which were designed and built with uh, two or three bedrooms and expansion space in the attic and a basement, such that you could have a lot of room for your family to expand into, with one or two people rattling around inside, uh, generally often aging. So the biggest opportunity in Vancouver is to give new life to those 100,000 bungalows uh, by allowing the owners at their discretion to split them up into two dwelling units first and even in many cases into three under certain circumstances. The profits to be made for the owners of those dwellings in terms of creating a nest egg for their retirement and a legacy for their children is an enormous advantage of this. The second advantage of this is you create a whole bunch of housing opportunities for people in their 30s and you create a revenue stream for people who buy into those bungalows which have the opportunity for conversion like the folks outside in my office who don't have a half million dollars to buy a house but have enough to buy a house which may cost them a half million dollars to start out with but they rent off a piece of it and they get 1500 bucks a month back that they can afford so, so what's holding what's holding people back from doing this I mean why is there this backlog why do you think the, the uh, people People haven't been able to step forward and just get this done. Well, two things to say about that. One is people everywhere are, are, are really conservative when it comes to issues in their neighborhood. The most conservative responses of people is over issues that uh, have to do with changes in their neighborhood. It doesn't matter where you go. Uh, having said that, however, the people of Vancouver, in North American terms, have been much more accepting than other citizens when it comes to changes in their neighborhoods. So there's been a lot of advances here that haven't occurred otherwise, elsewhere. For example, San Francisco uh, metropolitan area is completely frozen because none of their neighborhoods can be dramatically changed, particularly in the uh, first ring suburbs outside of San Francisco. Consequently, the housing costs there are absolutely unaffordable for people in their 30s. And you have this phenomenon, which is quite ridiculous, of San Francisco residents in their 30s who work in uh, who uh, who work in downtown uh, San Francisco, uh, having to commute an hour and a half to find any place that they can live, and the reverse is taking place too. Uh, people who live in small apartments in uh, in downtown San Francisco, like Cheek by Jowl with five others, are commuting all the way out to the office parks, another hour and a half in the other direction. And this is all partly because the whole system is frozen in place because there's no ability to gradually transform neighborhoods around workplaces and workplaces around neighborhoods. Well, I like to see the glasses half full in this case. Um, there, was an, uh, there, was an ins 
instance in my neighborhood in the area between Alma and McDonald in Kitsilano area uh, where the uh, they were they were already zoned for two dwelling units per parcel so a lot of the bungalows were being torn down and turned into duplexes some of them very beautiful duplexes others that didn't attract the affection of the people in the neighborhood to say the least um, and uh, over the course of what seemed like an interminable number of uh, meetings between the city planners and the neighborhood residents who were who were disturbed about the loss of these bungalows in their neighborhood basically uh, came a resolution to it which was not to simply disallow the the, the uh, conversions of these single-family homes to two families but the negotiated settlement if you will was that the bungalow would be preserved so what the people in the neighborhood had always seen was maintained, but it would be substantially rebuilt to not be two dwelling units, but three. So what the neighborhood, uh, what the neighborhood residents got was the preservation of the visual fabric of their neighborhood. And what the developers got and the, own, the new owners got was more, somewhat more affordable housing and uh, in a restored building, which is good for another 80 or 100 years. And in fact, the rebuild of these uh, bungalows is actually substantially better architecturally in terms of the construction and amenities than the original building that was replaced. So I think that's a good example of how Vancouver could continue to negotiate, even though it's arduous and it requires a lot of face time, if you will, between neighborhood people and planning department to continue that tradition, which I think has been effective to date and is a means by which the dramatic transformation of this city to a city dominated by families to one that's dominated by older people and young people without families can be, can occur. Well, over the course of the next, you know, 20 years, years or so, any transient who can afford 1500 bucks a month is somebody I want transienting through my neighborhood, uh, quite frankly. Uh, and uh, and the, and the second point is that these neighborhoods are transforming. It is no longer an option to imagine that your neighborhood will become refilled by uh, Ward and June Cleaver and uh, you know and uh, two or three or four kids. That's simply not in the future. That's a fact. There's no speculation in that. The demographics are in place that we can deal with. That's not occurring. So the options are for those neighborhoods to stay basically empty with one or two people in their 70s uh, or uh, be sold at a lower price uh, because there's a flat market, for, flatter market for the large families. So those 70 or 80 year old couple will not um, get as much money for their, uh, for their retirement or to take care of their health issues as they age. Uh, if you freeze the zoning, uh, what wants to be emphasized is that there's advantages to all sides in this equation. Uh, by opening up the zoning opportunity to allow for the, uh, the transformation of these land uses, it does increase the value of these parcels and the buildings on them because obviously you can maximize their, their utility. Sometimes uh, neighbors are not happy to have these additional units in, uh, in the neighborhood. Um, uh, how, uh, I mean, do they have reasonable, is that a, a fair objection? Well, everybody's objection is fair because people's concerns about their own neighborhood need to be taken seriously. It's, some, it's a matter of great concern to people. So their, uh, their concerns are fair to hear. Um, but uh, what you will find in, in this situation relative to changing uh, allowed land uses in large areas from single family zoning to allowing for a second unit on site is that <clears throat> there are many people who will gain from that. The owners in those neighborhoods now will see the value of their properties go up immediately uh, if there is this opportunity to transform a bungalow or a single family unit into two dwellings because that doubles you know, the number of units and uh, comes close to doubling the amount of return for uh, a redeveloped parcel. So it changes the economics. And what I like about the whole issue here is that there's a mutuality of benefits, that the people who are occupy these dwellings right now and have had the good fortune of, of, of living in these fine neighborhoods for a long time 
uh, who may be in a situation of uh, wanting to downsize uh, can see significant increases in value in in uh, in a transformation of these these parcels from one dwelling unit to two. At the same time, you open up more affordable housing options for people, generally younger people, coming into the housing market. And so what are the associated and related changes in the in the local area and neighborhood that that you could expect to see if if there was more of these kinds of uh, alternative units being developed on an average city block here in Vancouver? Well, uh, this relates to another uh, issue that I think is hugely important uh, that connects to the housing issue, and that's reestablishing the basic integrity of the relationship between neighborhood blocks and arterial streets that surround them. If you look at the map of Vancouver, it's very consistent. You'll have 100 residential blocks, and they will sit astride a commercial street or a main street or a Broadway or a Dunbar and those commercial streets have always provided walking distance access to commercial services and transportation. And the reason why the whole city looks the way it does is that it was set up as a trolley car street uh, city and presently we have a trolley car city that we don't have the streetcars anymore. Uh, the only thing missing is the streetcars. And so what I have found personally a little bit frustrating about the discussion around the RAV line is that this fundamental structure of Vancouver is being ignored, not being discussed. Uh, and the option of providing a more compatible transportation mode, reintroducing the streetcar, which, by the way, Portland has done with great success and succeeded beyond their wildest dreams such that they're expanding the system quite a bit more rapidly than they had originally anticipated. Reintroducing a modern streetcar on those streetcar arterials provided, in the Portland example, a huge real estate boom. In other words, the value of those parcels sitting astride the new streetcar line increased, uh, which led to a development boom and mixed-use commercial with residential above uh, on those arterials in Portland, which provided new commercial amenities, restaurants, uh, uh, you name it, office jobs that were very close to the, the residential neighborhoods which sat in the blocks behind. Uh, we could expect the same kind of response from the market in Vancouver were the streetcars reintroduced in a substantial way following the Portland model. And the city is really on the verge of really letting, real, this, we are absolutely on the verge of seeing those arterial streets like Maine, like Broadway, uh, like uh, commercial uh, take off, become very active areas for development. And when you look at the map of Vancouver, what you notice right away is the downtown, yeah, there's a lot of towers down there, and we're all very proud of that development, but it's geographically quite small. Uh, it doesn't, because it's so small, have the capacity to absorb very readily uh, uh, another 200,000 people, uh, which we might anticipate being... Uh, the, the nature of the population increase for Vancouver over the course of the next 20 years. But you're immediately also struck by the fact that these 200 kilometers worth of uh, commercial arterials, which in many cases are quite struggling uh, and are not the most attractive parts of our cities, um, Kingsway, another good example, uh, are, uh, have tremendous capacity to absorb this kind of development. And when they did absorb that kind of development, they would make the neighborhoods which sit behind it uh, much more inviting places to live. Uh, the, the, the attraction of these neighborhoods in many parts of the neighborhood is brought down by the somewhat derelict quality of the uh, commercial arterials, which are, which are the very hearts of these neighborhoods. So give us some examples of, of uh, uh, some specific sites of, of poorly uh, designed arterial, oh well, poor projects on arterials that, that bring the neighborhoods, related neighborhoods down, and then give us some examples uh, that we can shoot of, uh, of good neighborhood arterials that, um, uh, that 
things that you would really recommend as a solution for Vancouver? Well, I mean, I think uh, are numerous. Uh, the, the only one that's spring to my mind is uh, pretty much uh, where Kingsway intersects Main Street. Uh, but long stretches of Kingsway are not working, in my view, and they're not working because during the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, when the streetcars were removed and replaced in those neighborhoods, the suburbanization of those commercial arterials began, where IGAs and Safeways went into those neighborhoods and ripped out what used to, what used to be the commercial frontage, which addressed the sidewalk directly, and replaced that with very large parking lots. So you get uh, you get a strip on many of those commercial arterials, where there's the street and the parking lot and the building setback, or a McDonald's with a drive-through, uh, and so forth. The suburban landscape, which we're all very familiar with. Fortunately, in the case of Vancouver, the suburbanization and the auto orient of those commercial arterials didn't completely destroy the fabric of those streets. And in recent decades, it's been stopped, generally. You don't see large swaths of the city being torn down and replaced with parking lots anymore. And in certain instances, there's a reversal taking place. So, so on to good examples, uh, presently, because of the strength of the west side of Vancouver, Broadway and 4th Avenue are seeing quite a significant revival where McDonald's are being torn down and replaced with three or four story mixed use buildings. Uh, where the Safeway is being built uh, not with a parking lot out front, but above the parking lot with the front door addressing the street. Part of that is because the land there is valuable enough to parking, it doesn't make any sense to use valuable land for parking lots. So we're seeing some some good movement in those neighborhoods, which could be replicated throughout the city. Uh, a strength of Fourth Avenue and Broadway in the Kitsilano uh, area of West Side is the fact that the transportation services there are excellent. On both Fourth Avenue and Broadway, you can get a bus every two minutes or three minutes. So some of the qualities that we ascribe to streetcar arterials still exist there. We don't have the streetcar, but we have the 99B line. Uh, and, and numerous uh, trolley buses that serve that area very well. So accessibility from those neighborhoods is quite high. So my point, there is an integrity between the kinds of transportation modes that we choose as a city to pursue, the inherent structure of our city, which is uh, uh, will never change away from being a, uh, a streetcar city without streetcars, uh, the neighborhoods which exist astride those streetcar arterials uh, were always dependent on uh, the access to easy transportation and uh, will thrive to the extent that that transportation access is is protected and enhanced over the next few decades. Well, you know, that's the uh, classic chicken egg proposition and gets us back to where we started this conversation about what we do here. You know, we're, we look at sustainable communities and therefore we look at the connections between different attributes in the community. So housing is one aspect, one attribute of a community. Transportation is another attribute of a community, but you have to think about them as so, as, as linked as your heart is to your, you know, skeleton. I mean, it's just part of the same system. So the body of the city needs to be understood as a collection of these vital organs cooperatively operating to create a good place to live and a sustainable community. And Vancouver is really, uh, if it's careful, uh, going to continue to lead showing people uh, in North America and even beyond how to become a sustainable 21st century city. Uh, we all in this business fear that, you know, we could just as easily make a mistake and get it all completely wrong, and I personally think the rap line is, is a mistake, uh, but hopefully not one that is uh, one that will be uh, seriously damaging. Uh, but by and large, the, uh, the, the right decisions have outnumbered the bad decisions, and if we can keep that up for another couple of decades, Vancouver's going to be just tremendous.